Okay. So my talk today will be about even some theory in the setting of the gun growth per third conjecture. And so to start the talk off, I'm just going to give some automorphic backgrounds on the gun growth per third conjectures themselves. So the basic setting is this is a highlighter. Okay. So K or Q will be an imaginary quadratic field. Uh, and we have two Hermitian spaces, Vn and Vn plus one. Uh, they have dimensions n and n plus one respectively. And we have two groups, H, which is a unitary group on the smaller permission space, G, which is a product of the two unitary groups on each of them. And we have a diagonal embedding of H into G. So the UVN embeds into this UVN and naturally embeds into this bigger unitary group. And so there are two questions that one may ask. One is local in nature. So the local question is sort of a restriction problem. If we have a pi n plus, so if we have a place V and we have a irreducible representation, and let's just be clear, this is a smooth C coefficient irreducible uh, let, let's put in a decimal because I'm the okay, whatever. If that, uh, if, if I give a one such representation on G, how does not on G but on this bigger unitary group, how does that restrict how does that behave when you decompose it? How does that decompose when you restrict it to a smaller unitary group? So this would be a generalized. This representation pi is supposed to be automorphic. Uh, no, this is a local. Local, local. I see. Okay. Yes. So this is a local group. So it's smooth, irreducible, admissible representation. Thank you. Uh, so this would be a generalization of the classical branching theorem, where if you have a representation on a compact unitary group and we restrict to a smaller unitary group. Uh, but because we're in this more general situation, it may not decompose with finite multiplicity. Well, it may not decompose discreetly. Uh, so a more convenient formulation is this other multiplicity space formulation. Ah, I forgot the slide. So instead of taking one representation here, we are taking a representation on the big group G and we are going to compute this dimension, this multiplicity space. This is essentially the multiplicity of pi n v in pi n plus one v restricted to h, except there is some kind of dual here, which is a bit of an annoying issue. But that's, without the dual, this is a normal formulation. We want to compute this local multiplicity space. And correspondingly, there is a global question which is given by uh, some kind of automorphic representation. And let's not talk about exactly what yet. Uh, some kind of automorphic representation on G. We want to study the automorphic period. And uh, this notation, as usual, means. Can, can you see what I'm writing? Anyway, this notation means there's the normal identic space, uh, except, okay, let's not worry about some technicality. Yeah, so the local problem at the global problem can also be asked in the more general study of the relative length length program. That's all I'm going to say about that. So there is like a general framework for this. But the uh, nice thing about our setting with two unitary groups is we have answers to both the local problem and the global problem. So let's start with the basic answer, which was known before, is that this local multiplicity uh, space is always has always at most dimension one. So the restriction of 
So the restriction of a representation on a unitary group decomposes uh, multiplicity free. Um, the discrete part at least. And the, so this was no, like in the early 2005 maybe, uh, this set of words, this four also did it for the periodic case. And uh, so Drew did it for the Archimedean place. And so we can ask for a more refined version when is the multiplicity actually one. And this is the local gang girl for that conjecture, which is also known. Uh, again, both are placed, did it for the periodic case, Sue did it. You see completely different methods for the Archimedean place. And what it says is, so remember we had those two representations. Which is in the irreps of G, local G. And we were asking you about this kind of a multiplicity space. And it says, as both of them run over members of their respective Vulcan L packet, uh, there exists a unique pair such that this space is one dimensional. And for the other pairs, the space is zero dimensional. And the pair can be specified with by a completely local epsilon factor. So this Vulcan L packet is a bit technical in particular because it's an L packet, we need to assume temperedness. And the key point I want to say no. here is this contains. Okay. Can I raise a question? Yeah. Yes. Are you talking about the group GLN or is it a gender group uh, now? Uh, a G is always going to be this product of unitary groups. A product of unitary groups. So, okay. So the multiplicity one of uh, Eisenberg is for the unitary groups, it's only, okay. Uh, the multiplicity one of Eisenberg, they, they did many groups in, in the, around the same time. This is their annals paper from maybe yeah, yeah, 2004. Yeah. And yes, Eisenberg uh, Gorovich did the Archimedean place for the GLN, but uh, Sun and Zhu did it for the unitary groups. But when you- Yes, I got my history right. Uh, the theorem of uh, places, the Gandros Prasad is again for unitary groups, is it? Yes, that's, well, the local part is no, also for orthogonal also groups. Okay. Okay. But again, I'm just stating it for the unitary groups. Okay, so uh, we don't have the time. Okay, so I mean, there's a key point about uh, Vogel L packets now is that it contains representations from other inner forms. And this is all I'm going to say about the local picture in this general setting. On the next slide, I'm going to specialize with Archimedean place and give some concrete description of what this conjecture and what the theorem states. Uh, so before that, are there any other questions? Okay. So at the Archimedean place, uh, so the real place, and we are assuming the representation in the discrete series. So as everything I have, so this abstract statement I have said before are very concrete. So first of all, the group, the, the small unitary group is just UPQ for some pairs P and Q, which is the signature of the Hermitian space. And in this case, the Wogan L packet contains representations from like all such groups. And kind of a feature is you have to distinguish between U02 and U20, which are isomorphic as abstract groups. 
but they have different underlying information space. So this will sort of be important later. But yeah, so we are just talking about rep real representation theory of semi-simple Lie group, which in this case are unitary groups. And uh, so their discrete series are indexed by Harris Chandra parameters, uh, which is a tuple of P numbers corresponding to this P and a tuple of Q numbers corresponding to this Q. Uh, they are unordered, all, they are all distinct from each other, and they are in integers shifted by possibly a half. Uh, uh, the infinitesimal character is just a collection of all of them. Uh, the infinitesimal character is just uh, an ordered list of n numbers. So for example, the holomorphic discrete series would correspond to the parameter where B1 is greater than BQ and greater than A1, greater than AP. So the holomorphic discrete series would be this Q numbers are all greater than those P numbers. So any holomorphic would be the other way around, but they are already, there are, are many other discrete series. So in this case, when pi infinity is in the discrete series, the Vogel L packets are just indexed by the infinitesimal character, which is this list of numbers, an ordered list of N numbers. P, P is bigger than or equal to Q? We are not assuming P is bigger than or equal to Q. Oh, okay. This is important. We want to distinguish U20 and U02. Ah, uh -huh, okay. They are, diff they are different. They each contribute one representation to the L packet. So a Morgan L packet has size two to the N uh, where each UPQ contains n choose p representations, which is just given n numbers choose p of them to be the first n true. And so this is already, you can see we need all p, not just p greater than q. And this is a feature of the general theory of Morgan L packet is that its elements are indexed by characters of this finite abelian group. And it's kind of important to note I won't need to talk about this, but it's important to note that this index U depends on choices. Uh, I guess in this case, it's just a single choice of uh, additive character. So sort of there are two canonical ways of indexing this set. Okay, so that's the description of the Morgan L packet. It's just to tell you what, a, to give you a Morgan L packet, I need to give you n numbers. Uh, and uh, to specify an element in the Morgan L packet, I need to tell you P numbers from them. Okay, so now we have two, those and two one L packets, one for yeah, sorry. Additive character of uh, what the the real the complex. Uh, C. 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 Okay. Yes, because we are in the Archimedes place. place. Uh, basically, you need to decide. It, it's determined up to. Uh, it's determined up to, like action of R cross. So there are exactly two choices up to. There are two, classes of choices you can make. I both need to talk about the exact indexing. So we may have one L packet for UVN. Oh my God. Okay. So this is uh, this is N plus one. I hope that's fine. And another L packet for Morgan L packet for UVN plus one. So those are list of numbers. Those are in Z plus N minus one over two. And those are in Z plus N over two. 
at uh, by the general description from the local GDP conjecture, you should expect exactly. Uh, so given those two n plus one numbers, you should expect exactly one pair of representations, one from this group, one from this other group, such that their multiplicity is one. So the I I would this usually call the distinguished pair. And this is determined by kind of a weight interlacing. Which in this case, let, let's just do an example where a is three. So the shaded squares are those which satisfy a y is greater than a i is greater than b j. So because this we are shading this square here, and so therefore we need to shade any squares to the right. And because a three is bigger than b two, we also have a two is bigger than b two. So we need to shade it downwards. So you get this kind of shape, which is a staircase, which some people, Michael Harris also calls a tableau, basically a set which is close to the right and to, uh, going down. And there is an exact combinatorial recipe which gives such a tableau. This tableau depends only on the relative sizes of those two and plus one numbers. Uh, there's a combinatorial recipe that given a tableau will tell you the pair of distinguished representations. And uh, this was already, this, this was known way before that, but it's written out in this way by a token quite recently. And I'm just going to do an example in this case where so the point is you first count the the count the parity of the number of shaded square in each row and column. So there's a minus sign and a plus because there's an even number and again a minus because there's an odd number. So we get uh, a string of three signs as a string of four signs and we need to flip every other sign. So we get two sequences of signs which are all minus and because they are all minus they should correspond to P should be the number of minus sign. So we get U3, zero cross U4, zero. And because they are compact groups, there is a unique representation per infinitesimal character. That's just the highest weight representation. So what we are getting is the representation, the unique, in particular, we are getting that the highest weight representation are U4, zero, when restricted to U3, zero, uh, contains uh, this. Oh, uh, okay. Should have written this out. This this staircase represents the perfect interlacing. Uh, you can check. And the point is, this recovers classical branching law. I mean, the point is there is a precise combinatorial recipe that give, give a, a set of interlacing tells you which inner forms of the unitary group you should take and within each inner form tells you which representation you should take. And I won't need the details later. I just want to tell you there is, it's relatively simple. Um, any questions before I move on to the global picture? Okay, uh, so global answer, and uh, this is the real reason we are doing it in the unitary group setting is the global answer, the global question is just outright no. Uh, starting with works of a Zhao, I've recently completed by both Plessy, Liu, Zhao, and Zhu. And in our case, which is the tempered case. So we are given a tempered stable, whatever. Well, I should add custodial. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh in the local case the 
recipe is given is only for the discrete series or it for for other representations also is it this is only for the discrete series okay at infinity okay because they are exactly labeled as horizontal parameters okay for the tempered representations at infinity there is a more complicated recipe okay. uh in terms of the lagrange parameter not the lagrange parameter well in terms of a refined lagrange parameter uh at the periodic places where well, we we don't have a good way of labeling everything explicitly so but yeah, this, this recipe is only for these species. Okay, so we are given a tempered stable cuspidal, I guess that's included, uh, pi on the big group, which is u v n cross u v n plus one. And we are studying the pure integral where so h again is u v n. And we are asking the non vanishing question. When does the period vanish? And yes, I even only if there are two conditions. The first one is pi v has to be locally distinguished. And this is clear from representation theory because this period integration is an element, is a home space of the global H, which decomposes as a product of the local home spaces. So if this has a chance to be non-zero, we must have each of the local home space to be non-zero. And so we must have pi v is a discrete element of L pi. So this is clearly a necessary condition. And it's not sufficient by itself. There is a global obstruction, which is this central value of L function does not vanish. And this is a ranking zero working. Uh, for GLN of the imaginary quadratic field. So we implicitly need to use the base change of pi here. And in any case, we, we have a precise formula, uh, which is variously, which is like, Ichino Ikeda formula, essentially, which says the central L value is a period integral modulus squared uh, times local factors at times some other L values, among which are the adjoint L values, uh, plus there's some abelian ones, which are really not that important. So adjoint is kind of important in this case. But we made those adjoint. This part is not zero always. At the point of this formula is we have an integral representation for those Reckin Zilberg L functions. Uh, but this integral representation be an integral over H. And H is HA mod HQ. So it has the finite part. HAF mod HQ times this Archimedean part. And this depends on the signature of H. There's like even the dimension depends on the signature of VN. And Besides this, uh, this the integral shape, this integrand, this phi, which is in pi, which is pi finite tensor pi infinity, depending on the exact representation we use for pi infinity, this phi may be a holomorphic vector, maybe an anti holomorphic vector, maybe something else. And so the point is the shape of this integral depends on the the exact description of H and pi infinity, which as we saw previously in the local study, depends on the weight interlacing at infinity. Excuse me. The yes. adjoint means adjoint with respect to G or H. The adjoint is 
eight years the L function at one of no, let, let, let's actually just say the assign L function for mm. for pi n and an assign. Okay, yeah, yeah. For pi n plus one. We get it. Thank you. So the so the point I was making was the the integral representation of the L function depends in a very crucial way on the RTBD of it racing. At this plus adjoint L part function part are expected to give us the uh, transcendental period. So the transcendental period also depends on weight relacy. So the periodic L function that we would eventually hope to construct should depend on it too. So this is already where I see multiple periodic L functions showing up. Uh, and the other questions before I move on to the arithmetic story. Yeah, so I quite don't understand uh, what do you mean by an integral representation? It is for the full L function you're saying of the- uh, this, this, is the well, the this is for the full L function. Well, this is for the L value. Okay. Uh, but are you saying this theorem implies the existence of an integral representation or uh, does it- Yes, this is part of the theorem. It's part of the theorem, okay. Yes. And the non-vanishing is just the fact that it's uh, the L values of the adjoint are at S equal to one. That's all, is that so? Uh, this part of non-vanishing, wait, where are you? Okay, right. This part of non-vanishing is trivial. Trivial, uh, yeah. right. No, not that trivial. Uh, so the, this integral representation depends on the fact that the local factor is not equal to zero if I don't give this. Okay. okay. This is not exactly trivial. So the local factors, uh, well, the exact statement is that if pi v is a discrete element, then there exists a uh, phi v such that the local factor does not vanish. Okay. So given this statement, the this formula implies the number one issue result. Yeah, okay. okay. So let's talk about the arithmetic pictures. Not the arithmetic GGB, no, the, the actual arithmetic picture. Uh, and you note I put a counter gradient here. Us. It this will make everything nicer, maybe. So we fix a prime p, which is ordinary. This will be a crucial assumption, and the other crucial assumption will be split in k. Uh, otherwise, we barely know how to do it in the case of a single unitary group. Split means from entirely split, total, completely split. Ah, uh, no, so K is imaginary quadratic. So split just me. Ah, I see, I see. K is imaginary, okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, in this case, there is a zero uh, due to Sophie and Chris Skinner. Well, Sophie did a lot of it at the Chris three and managed to get it at some of the bad places too. In the make statement is, there is a conjugate self-dual, uh, which means rho n contract gradient is isomorphic to the rho n complex conjugation up to a twist, which I don't remember. Uh, it's either n or minus n or one minus n. It's up to a twist. So there is a conjugate self-dual representation, rho n attached to it, and this part is from the ordinarity implies the upper triangular shape for each of the prime of all P when you restrict to the decomposition group. And basically from this, we can choose a basis for 
row n, which I've also used to denote the representation space, so that with respect to this basis, it's upper triangular. And uh, we can identify using conjugate self duality row n, essentially row n restricted to the conjugate place. There is a bar here. We can identify row n restricted to the conjugate place by row n dual. So we can use the dual basis. As a, with respect to the dual basis, this will be lower triangular. And uh, this is all for a single representation n. And we can do the same thing for pi n plus one. And uh, we have row. There again, there is a twist here, which actually there may not need to be a twist there. There is a twist by something. There, there may be a twist, which means it so is actually cutting itself through of weight minus one. At weight minus one in this story means the corresponding L value is the central L value. And then we can write down the basis, which is VI dual tender WJ. So I goes from one to N and J goes from one to N plus one. Uh, just in case I didn't make it clear, we are always writing under the assumption pi infinity is a discrete series. Okay, so we have this n times n plus one dimensional Galois representation. We can compute its Hodge state weights. And again, this depends on the infinitesimal character of pi infinity. And the uh, formula that I'm not going to state. Yeah, it's a bit annoying and very easy to make mistake. But the point of whatever computation that we do for this means we have a Pachishkin subspace. Uh, let's just recall that a subspace is Pachishkin. If W has negative Hodge-Tate weights and the quotient has non-negative Hodge-Tate weights, and it's kind of the, the nice thing about being fully ordinary, for real ordinary, is that we can always have this partition subspace, uh, which is, again, depends on the weight interlacing. So like if you think of the top row I drew earlier, let's just do a easy example, something like this, where we, I was labeling this B1, B2, uh, this A1, A2, and A3. If you similarly label them by like V1 check, V2 check, uh, W1, W2, W3, you'll get that the shaded parts are exactly the basis elements that should generate uh, some partition subspace. And this is for a single prime, so for one prime P above for one p, frac p above p. At the other prime, you need to use a, you need to use conjugate self duality to define something similar. So, kind of a picture should be that if the weight interlacing is this kind of tableau, then this should be a row square, and this blank part should be row square. Except this is really not true. They, they, they are not destroyed. This is just a picture I like to look at. And there is an inherent asymmetry between the two primes above P because we need to secretly identify uh, C with QP bar. And that identification truth is embedded. So, it, it looks, yeah, so this is not symmetric in P and P bar.
at basically the upshot now is weight interlacing determines the correct local condition at P. Uh, you're assuming the GAN gross Cossard condition to be satisfied. It's multiplicity one for pi m. Is that uh, exactly one? Or this is a general thing, this Funchishkin condition and all? I not, well, multiplicity one is no. And I'm not, I do not need any GAN gross Cossard conjecture for this case. This oh. is a purely arithmetic calculation involving hot state weights. Okay. So now like those squares would denote de 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 like weight interlacing top low or whatever. So if we had two of them, a square and a triangle, we can define a silver group, which is I ramified away from P to Greenberg at Greenberg for square using P and Greenberg for triangle use at this Greenberg condition. Yes. Like the restriction of a class at say p is in the kernel of h1 okay i i it's not the it's not the greenberg condition yeah. but some people may say yes this I said Greenberg, actual Greenberg condition would put the inertia group here, but I'm putting the whole decomposition group here. Maybe, uh, but you know, I I, guess I, I I am putting the whole decomposition group here, but the, the, this is the local condition I'm putting at P as there's a similar say for P, it's is an P where you write P bar. And the point is, if so, given rho, we have an Archimedean place. And as Archimedean place, we have a weight interlacing. If the square is that interlacing, then this is a block cattle several group for rho because it has a, because it will be the exact partition condition at P and P bar. So this is a one. Well, this is a space with arithmetic significance. All the others are variations of similar structure that could be interesting, but not immediate arithmetic significance. This is the one that should relate to L values. And now we can deform everything in Hida family. Uh, be because pi. Okay, so because at P is split, U N, the U of V N restricted at P is just G O N of Q P. So we have N variables from U N and N plus one variables for U N plus one. This is all because P splits. So we may have this many variables and using pseudo representation assume you enough residual reducibility condition, we can deform the Gower representation in, in something valued in ordinary big heavy algebra I, sort of the usual setup for HEDA theory with the filtration. With ordinary filtration. There is a nicer way to just construct to construct the big hour representation. You you can do it directly from a uh, group cohomology. But is, is this heck algebra is an integral domain or a kind of reduced local reduced local lane? It's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a irreducible component of uh -huh. the bigger C. Hmm. It's 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 integral. Okay. I will eventually assume it's normal too, but yeah. Okay, so 
they, they are based to construct the government representation from a uh, group cohomology. But uh, until we have like an uh, integral algorithmic relation, I don't see a way of doing the ordinal filtration on the big government representation. So you have to resort to single representations, which is kind of a cheat. But yeah. So the, the previous prescriptions can be used to define those big server groups. And the key point is this family rule has been very weight. The weights can change. When you are PM, you are working periodically, you forget about the notion of the Archimedean ordering. So we are seeing all possible weight interacting at the same time. So this several group is significant for all possible weight interacing. By value applying a family, we are suddenly accessing all of the other several groups. short on time. So we have sort of unexpected form of Ivasama Bay conjecture, which is uh, there should be a periodic L function interpolating the central L values as a specialization with the Archimedean weight integration square. So that's the point I was making that the integral representation depends very crucially on the Archimedean behavior. So there is no reason a priori to expect a periodic L function to interpolate multiple regions. Uh, there are, I mean, there shouldn't be. So there is one periodic L function per square. And we have defined the silver group. Uh, this H2 is not a typo. H2 of compact should be like the dual of the H1 uh, P divisible. So this is the usual silver. This is the usual C you will see a Yiva Sama conjecture. And furthermore, we might want to say that now they are zero. So in particular, H2 square is not, is torsion. And L square is non-zero, meaning generic non vanishing And the point is this expectation just cannot hold for very trivial global root number reasons. Why? Yeah. Why? I will explain on the next slide. I basically three that if both sides are zero, this is trivial. So I will briefly explain the global loop number reason. Uh, because p is split and ordinary, you can prove that epsilon f defined on the Galois side is constant in the family, the finite part of the epsilon factor. So the Archimedean epsilon factor depends only on weight iteracy. So we have two cases. The global root number is plus one. The coherent case, everything I said works. The incoherent case, the global root number is minus one. The L bar half pi for all pi is a family with the correct weight iteracy. And uh, that's kind of the, so we are interpreting zero for periodic L function. But because of Blocado conjecture, we expect because this is zero, the silver group should have rank one. So we have some kind of make incoherent main conjecture, which, uh, follow, which is following you, part of use main conjecture. And uh, this is the incoherent main conjecture that the compact silver group has rank one, because this should interpolate like uh, special cycles. And this will be at the Higner point. Uh, this statement where uh, uh, Francesc talked about that in his middle course last week. Uh, is a special case of an elliptic curve where this would just be the Higner point. So, so we have a coherent case and an incoherent case. Coherent case, we have the normal weight conjecture. Incoherent case, we have this slightly more unusual looking weight conjecture, which is still quite normal. 
And now the question is what happens when a pair of weights orders are reversed? So instead of like A greater than B greater than A1 greater than B1 greater than B2 greater than A2, instead of this, we change it to B1 greater than A1 greater than etc. What happens now? Uh, it's kind of represented by this picture. We are deleting an extreme corner of the staircase. So it's a simple fact that you can compute that the weight interlace you, they have opposite, the epsilon infinity have opposite signs. By the sign, I mean the Archimedean part of the local, the Archimedean local root number. Uh, because earlier I drew the picture where I want you to think of this as row squared and this as row squared uh, conjugate, you can see that when I'm sort of taking away the square, the several condition decreases at the prime at this prime above p, but it increases at the opposite prime. So again, there is no relation, no immediate re containment relation between the several groups. Uh, but still, you can prove the lemma, which is a generalization of what uh, Francesc stated last time uh, in the mini course, which is essentially those two main contracts are equivalent if we can construct special elements in several class, several groups. Uh, this equivalence, and the way you prove this lemma in this generality is you need to define a common map in this generality. But the common map in this generality is still a one-dimensional common map because all we are dealing with is this one-dimensional piece. That is the proof. And then follows through the usual arguments. So the upshot of this so, whole picture. Sorry, uh, this yes. uh, Z, Z triangle also some localized, it's, it's non-vanishing under localization. Ah, yes, yes. I, I kind of assume that if the triangle exists in such in this sense. So yes, you would want, by the triangle, I already mean it needs to be non-zero when restricted at P or P bar, I said P. Anyway, yeah, this, this is not a precise statement. This is just uh, the flavor. L let me do this. So for a heat of family, we have two n plus one choose n main conjectures. The incoherent main conjectures involve those special classes that I was being vague about. And each special classes, say we have a special class here, the, we would expect it to be related to coherent main conjectures for many other weight interlaces. So you can delete this square, you can delete this square, but you can also add in a square, which is just involves doing all the arguments before, but taking a complex conjugation. And the way you result, the result is you get a coherent main conjecture where the Piatigal function is more typically defined, meaning it's the common map of some special class. And then what we usually call explicit reciprocity law means uh, we need to identify this common map of special classes with Piatigal function defined using interpolation. Any questions about this philosophical slide? This several can be made precise. Uh, the several can be made precise. It's just our possible ways of adding or deleting a quarter. As far as the results, yes, the results I have, as far as I, I can do. do. I expect something more, but yeah. 
oh, right. Uh, this picture was also described by Lovler Zerbis in the case GSB4 cos GL2 cos GL2, which is a special case of the orthogonal GGT conjecture. Well, which is just a gross product conjecture. Wait, because this is 04 and this is 05, essentially. So let's and, quickly. Sorry, uh, what uh, Ashay has said, what, so the several depends on what? This coherent main conjectures, what does it depend on several? Does it depend on choice of integral data? Or, uh, the main conjecture depends on the choice of the integral data, which for me comes from the weight interlacing at our median place. Okay, and so the several means there are different choices of integral data which you can Yes, use yes different choices of data should give you different main conjecture, which I'm going to do as the simple example right now. If that's not clear, you can ask me later. Okay. Well, after. So I will very quickly run through a simple example, which is n equals to one. So in this case, a small group is just a normal element and obviously imagine quadratic field. The big group is a small group times a U2, which is essentially GL2 or an inner form of GL2. So the big representation pi is essentially anti anticyclotomic character times the modular form. Uh, let's just say the character has weight L and minus L and modular form has weight K. So those are the infinitesimal characters. Uh, and we are assuming P is ordinary for F and splits in K, that's the study of hypothesis. So we have the normal ordinary filtration. So we have three separate conditions. Relax means no condition. Ordinary is a usual summer condition, which is the kernel of this. And strict is the strict. Uh, you are not allowed to have restrictions there. So we have those three types of similar condition. We have three weight interlacing relations depending on the Archimedean weight. So explicitly, the anticyclotomic character has big weight. It has very big but negative weight, and it has small weight relative to the modular form. And correspondingly, they should they they should depend on those three several conditions. So this would be the normal, let's, this would be the usual server group. And those two are the Greenberg server groups. And so coherence, Yes, epsilon infinite epsilon is the finite part times the infinite part. Infinite part is just described again by weight interlacing, but finite part depends on data at the other places. And this is where the Hickner hypothesis comes in. Uh, in the simple case, the Hickner hypothesis, there's a classical one just says the finite part would. So this is a classical one, you can classify that part as plus one. In this case, this is an incoherence case. And we have the Hegner point, which can be interpreted in Hina family by the works of Howard. Those two are the coherent cases. They should have Piatigel functions. They have Piatigel functions, which are the BDP Piatigel functions. So we have the BDP main conjecture, which corresponds to those cases. And in the middle, we have the parallel real main conjecture. And this is exactly what Frances said. Those main conjectures are equivalent because we know Higner points exist and are not vanishing. In the exact opposite case, this is coherent. This is incoherent. Because this is incoherent, we expect a special class here. And this is not known to exist. 
we, we don't know how to construct it until recently uh, in the thesis of uh, Tuan. And sort of a point is, key point is it does not come from some geometric cycles directly. It comes from the triple product. And given the given twice construction of the cycle, we can deduce rank zero BSD formula for modular forms twisted by anti cyclotomic characters. You see the incoherent may conjecture implies coherent may conjecture at Euler system argument. And are there any questions about those examples? I just have one more slide left. This is the n equals to two case. It's already a mess. So we know very little about this. And I, I have labeled for each page interlacing exactly which representations it should correspond to. So compact is the compact form which so there is the unique one. And the other non compact form, which is U21, we have the holomorphic one, the anti-holomorphic one, and the generic one. So the Wolga L packet has four elements. Well, it has eight elements, but four essentially distinct elements. So let me tell you what's known in this picture. If you are pairing holomorphic with holomorphic, this is Michael Harris square root pi algebra function. This is like 2021. Uh, if you are trying to construct pi algebra functions here, uh, Mulroy is going to talk about this. His joint work with Harris and Yamana. Yamana. And those cases, when you are pairing generic with holomorphic or anti-holomorphic modular forms, you wouldn't, you can't just use normal heta theory, you need to use higher heta theory. And according to a remark made by Michael Harris, this is work in progress with Eschen and uh, Pilumi. I'm not aware of works in the other area. And those are for constructing piadigal functions. And for constructing cycles, this is the only one with where there is a diagonal cycle. And so because we have this diagonal cycle and we have those proposed constructions of piadigal function in the neighbor of the diagonal cycle, we can potentially prove the explicit reciprocity laws for all of those four arrows. Those are probably doable, but I don't know how to do anything beyond that. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that's my talk, thanks. Thank you. So let's thank speaker. Any question and comment? One question, just wait. Yeah, I had a sort of more of a comment and then a question. So this interlacing condition shows up in various parts of mathematics. One place it shows up very famously is in the theory of hypergeometric functions, where you have sort of 2F1, standard Gauss hypergeometric, and then you have NF n plus one, which is the generalization where you have n parameters AI and then n plus one parameters BJ. And there's a famous theorem that says that these are algebraic exactly when you have this interlacing condition, which is sharper than yours, they really alternate. I was just wondering if there's some connection between this theorem and yours, your work. I, I, well, 
I don't know. I look into that because recently Kartik challenged me to come to his archive media and they don't even use it. Sorry, recently what? So Sorry, Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, please. I didn't hear. What did you say? Yeah, so Kartik recently asked me to compute the Archimedia uh, local factors, which are like integrals on the Archimedia part. Those would presumably involve hypergeometric series showing up implicitly or explicitly. So maybe. But that's an interesting observation. I didn't know about that. Okay, yeah, thanks. Any other question or comment? So, um, uh, missing cycle, also, you have a uh, candidate? No, well, eventually, I'm working on that. I, I will tell you more when you get here. Yes, yeah. Any other question or comment? So let me ask one question that in your main conjecture, you have this uh, L function and L square, L square or something like that. And you say that this L square thing is integral in the Yvesau algebra or Heck uh, algebra. Wait, are, are we talking about this conjecture? Not before. One before. So this one, number two. Okay, which would just be this one. Yeah, that's right. And uh, L square, that is sort of. I, I would expect it to be integral in the Hecke algebra because I'm assuming Borel ordinary at P. I see. But on the other hand, I mean, this corresponding Galois representation residually could contain trivial representation. Right? I am assuming it's residually irreducible. So oh, you are assuming that. Oh, okay. Because at some point I needed to use the student representation. I see, I see. So then no problem. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Yes. I, I, I'm very interested in working on the residually irreducible case, but that's not. Okay, okay. Thank what you. This is about yet. Any other question? Okay, so let's thank speaker again.